is a collective group of women and men from all different industries. We have never had, from poverty to home ownership to senior leaders, we call it leadership now as of today, all the way to the family offices in one group. We have hand selected a lot of you to come due to the fact of what your expertise is. So this panel is the first time we've ever had the MBA part of us um, on the Empower. And I'm so thankful to be able to call Marcia Davies, the CEO, COO, sorry, of the MBA who founded Empower in her spare time <laughs> to be here and moderate this panel. What you don't know is the work that goes behind the scenes to make something like this happen. And I'm not talking about the conference. I'm talking about the endless days and hours we spend to making sure that we can help move gender equality on all forms of harassment. So I was very pleased and delighted to see her take on the sexual harassment and impact of what it's doing in the financial industry. So with further ado, I'd love to introduce Marsha Davies, my personal friend, to the stage. Thank you. Thanks. I'm going to put this somewhere so we don't get feedback. We got mics galore. All right, Desiree, you keep it because you're going to field questions from the audience. So I thought for those of you who have never experienced Empower before, last year, in addition to doing sessions like this, we did a full day programming, personal development for women in our industry. And I'd like to give you a snapshot of what that looked like. So, Jamaica, if we can roll the sizzle reel. With sound, maybe? This is a great opportunity. It has never happened at MBA in our 104 year history. It's time to be empowered. Let's get started. Ladies, today is here. There is a lot of power and influence in this room. We need to un understand the issues. That's why I encourage so many uh, of our partners to participate today. Uh, I don't think there's been anything but a white guy in my role. Um, and that just tells you how important it is that we're having this dialogue here at this association. A day like today where we're focused on women and leadership and knowing our value, that's telling everybody in the company that we got to level the playing field. Just like We have over 340 women here as we learn from a terrific group of speakers. Leadership today is about relationships. It's about empowerment and it's about trust. All the things that women rank the highest in. All these wonderful women, you know, with the great stories. I think I can totally resonate with all of them. We have so much to give and we can all use each other and utilize our knowledge to and share with everyone else to grow together. Um, this is actually my first MBA conference. I'm brand new to the industry, so this is very powerful for me to be able to see you know, so many successful women. And I'm really excited that we had this opportunity to get together before the conference. That way we can meet new people and then really spend quality time together throughout the rest of the conference. And if you say what you want to say, Talking about this is not enough anymore. You need to take action, and empower is all about action. Empower means inspire. And believing in myself. Direction. Authentic and inspiring. Joy, love, passion, courage. This is attainable. This is accessible. That you can do this. These kind of events are the kind of things that empower women to take more responsibility, to take more risks, and to move your company along. The more they do, the more we do. Thank you to the wonderful people at MBA, especially the forces behind Empower. Thank you. Thank you, MBA. Thank you, Marshall. Thank you, Dave, for making this a reality. So, 
to show that sizzle reel, it took the whole day and it boiled it down to about two and a half minutes, was because we had 5,000 people there. And I know a lot of you aren't surprised, but at an MBA annual convention, you see a lot of men. And I thought it was important to bring the work that we're doing and the support we're getting from male leaders and female leaders inside the ballroom. So we showed that clip as part of our chairman's opening remarks so that people at the convention understood this isn't just something that is being done on the side, that MBA is committed to it. And I'll be talking a little bit more about it, but we're doing it again on October 13th in Washington, D.C., so I hope all of you can join us and really be part of the dialogue and the discussion. So Desiree, thank you for my introduction. Desiree and I, I always tell the story, she was very purposeful. I was hosting, um, before it was branded Empower, I was hosting networking receptions for women at a lot of the MBA events. And Desiree sought me out and she said, you're gonna do more, right? And that's how we started, our friendship and the partnership that we have here today. So before we get started, I was gonna set the framework for our discussion a little bit, if that's okay. And I don't know about you, but I'm gonna tell you a little bit about myself because maybe all of you started out thinking, yay, I'm going into mortgage finance or I'm going into the financial services arena or I'm gonna own my own business. I grew up in a farm in New Jersey. And I can tell you, being in mortgage finance was nowhere in my life plan. As a matter of fact, I was raised by you know, a pretty typical family in the 60s where mom stayed at home and dad worked and it was just assumed that I would probably get married and have a couple of kids and stay home. Well, that didn't happen. And life brought me to Washington, D.C. And I was very fortunate early in my career to have an amazing female boss. Now, I didn't like her at first because I had been working at the Association of Trial Lawyers for about a year, and then they were growing the size of their conferences, and they brought in a woman to be my boss. And I'm all of 22, maybe. And I'm like, wait, I don't need, you don't need to be the boss of me. I can be the boss of me. I didn't know what I didn't know because I was so young and naive, but I gave her the hardest time. I was not your ideal employee. I did my work, but I like, wasn't, you know, I didn't warm up to her and she'd invite me to a meeting and I'd sit there with my hands crossed and, and you know what she did? She championed me and she supported me and she gave me big assignments and projects. And after about six months, I realized my life was better with her being my manager because she wanted me to be successful. She saw how hard I worked and she championed me. So lesson number one for me was, I wanna be like her when I get to lead an organization. The second was I had been at Freddie Mac, which was my second job in Washington, D.C., for about seven years. And I was in the same business line that I had been in. I got promoted along the way, but I was at that time a director. And my boss, who was vice president, he took me out to lunch. And he said, you know what? I know you love what you do and you're good at what you do, but there is a ceiling for that particular job inside of Freddie Mac. It might, might not be that way anymore, but back then, it's like we're, they're probably never gonna make that position a vice president or bigger. So if you want to go further in your career, you need to step out of your comfort zone. And I have just the job for you. He literally, during the time, I don't know if any of you remember when Freddie Mac had an issue with multifamily properties back in the very early 90s, stock tumbled in half. We only wish the stock price was like that now, but back then it was a crisis, the stock. And they removed the head of public affairs. Big job. My boss put me in charge of public affairs. And I said to him, A, I know nothing about what makes a good press release or a bad press release. I know nothing about this field you put me in. He said, you have all the skills to lead this department. He said, you have technicians working for you. You have people who know 
What are good press releases from a bad press release? What you have are the qualities in a leader. He said, you can influence people. You empower your teams. You instinctively know if something's off. He said, that's what I need in the job. And because he saw in me things I didn't even see in myself, that's what I also try to do with the people who are working with me and the people that I meet throughout these events. Because sometimes we think we have to be so, our skills have to directly translate to whatever this next job may be. And I think it's a really valuable lesson to know a lot of the skills that we have translate all across very different functions and jobs. So part of why I wanted you to know a little bit about me is I never expected to be here. When we created Empower, I never expected it to grow as quickly and have the momentum that it has. But I'm so thankful that it has, and I'm thankful for all of you to take time out of your Sunday to come here, come hear us today and network, and um, hopefully you'll take away some great relationships and some great friendships. So all that being said, there was a lot of stuff along the way, right? I came into this industry, I was 25 years old, and there wasn't a group like this for me to kind of latch on to and help guide me. There weren't a lot of women in leadership. So I was left to navigate it all on my own. And as you know, I'm sure if I asked each one of you what's been the biggest stuff you had to deal with as you managed your career, a lot of them probably look like the stuff that women are still dealing with. So let's take a look at what that is. Is this the right thing? There we go. So we uh, pull a lot of research from Catalyst and a lot of other groups. This is actually from a blog post of a woman who went out and was surveying women to say, what are you still dealing with? And we see pay equity, biases, conscious and unconscious biases, sexual harassment, needing more flexible work schedules. And so all of these, as leaders, should be stuff we could be able to tackle, right? We should be able to really work through it. And we can, but you have to be intentional about it. And that's some of what we're going to talk about today. And so I have been most heartened by the fact that when we talk about empower, it's not just me talking about Most of them were men. And I was asked to come in and talk about Empower. And Tamara, I think you were in the room. And I got about two sentences out, and guess what happened? I was interrupted by a man. And normally that would really irritate me, but not on that day, because he took over the conversation. He started talking about what we do and how important it is and how executives need to pay attention to this and what he's doing in his organization. And then another executive around the table started speaking about what they're doing or the challenges they're having. The conversation went on for 20 minutes. That's the impact we can have by raising the issues and not just griping. We're not here to gripe. We're here to talk about solutions. And so hopefully today, we're going to get into some of the more complex things that go on, and we have these great leaders that are going to be up here, and they're going to help us talk about some of the solutions that work, maybe some of our blind spots, things that they've tried that haven't worked, so maybe we don't have to go down that path. So I'm really looking forward to it. So I was talking about the growth of Empower. We have grown into... Um, almost 1,700 in our online network. We've had 4,500 women attend events, and we have now been asked to go to nine regional conferences. And so far, we've been saying yes to all of them, but pretty soon we might have to start saying 
can we do that next year? Because as Desiree said, this is something we do at MBA on top of the work that we already have. So right now we're going with the momentum and it's growing. It's just growing bigger and quicker than um, any of us had thought about. So I talked to you a little bit about, there we go, the Empowering Youth Summit. So we have Mika Brzezinski back and she's not there to talk to us about Know Your Value. She's gonna talk to us about office politics. She's gonna talk to us about navigating issues in the workplace, as well as having it all. So for women who are, you know, primary caregivers, or if you have um, the ability where you can work full time, but you also have to keep everything at home going, how do you balance all that and still make time for yourself? So that's what she's doing. Janine Driver, did anybody go to her IMB conference? Janine is this amazing, speaker on body language, and she's funny, because she used to do stand-up comedy. So what she does is walks you through some of the myths about how you carry yourself when people say, don't do this. Well, actually, she'll tell you why doing this is a really good thing for your brain to do. And she'll also tell you how you can tell if somebody's not being truthful by the way they show up. So if you ever wonder if your colleagues lie to you, Go listen to Janine, because she'll tell you. And then Jane Park, who is the CEO and founder of Jill of Beauty, she's also starting um, to write a book, and she has a checklist of all the questions you should ask if you're interviewing for a job, or if you're interviewing for a promotion, so that you can see the type of environment and culture you'll be entering. So I think what she, she also has her own personal story. She used to be the like chief innovation officer at Starbucks before she launched her own beauty company, which is now being sold. So other than that, you know, she's, and she's young, so she's done all of this early in life and she's just continuing to think outside the box and be entrepreneurial. So she's gonna be great to hear from. We've also started, there we go, a webinar series, Empower Your Career. And I am proud to say, our first webinar had over 300 people subscribe to it with one announcement. We have another one coming up in September that, um, Amanda, have we promoted it yet? Uh, just briefly. Okay. Excellent. So that's about negotiating your worth. So if you feel like you don't have time to read Mika's whole book or if you feel like you've listen to a bunch of podcasts that tell you how to go in and really know your value and negotiate your worth. This is another perspective from a woman named Jan Molino, but they are free. And if you're part of the community, you should be able to easily see the updates on when our um, series are. And then we've had, um, is the wrong clicker? Thank you. Empower Moments, I don't know if any of you saw some of them at once a month. It's a short video clip. I spend time interviewing folks, leaders in the industry. Um, I've done one with Jan Fox, who is a speech coach telling, and it's their quick little sound bites. What should we do when we're on stage? What should we not do? How do you get rid of saying, um, you know, those types of things. So you see that I think they come out the second week of every month. So this is one of my favorite quotes. Yeah, you thought it was the right one. So there we go, Jane Fonda says, women want to be safe, seen, and celebrated. And I think it's so important as we talk about gender equality to really understand that it's a complex topic, but yet it seems so simple when you think about it, safe, seen, and celebrated. So women make up, hello, 51% of the workforce 89% of purchase decisions. So think about that. We are driving the economy. And if you think about it, if you're marketing, you would really be marketing to women, right? So women in ads, we appear half as much. We get a quarter screen time. Whoa, it's advancing on its own. We get a quarter screen time.
And we get one out of seven speaking roles on TV. You're gonna hear more from Gina Davis because she's gonna be at the Empower event during the annual convention. Yet, what you saw that we advanced to, we do excel in one area. We excel at, women excel at wearing revealing clothes on TV. Six times more than men are in revealing clothes. So what does that say to our daughters and our sons? These are the kind of cues that happen which make this topic complicated. And how are we marketing to the next generation? That's how women are still being depicted. So it's complex and it's gonna take a lot. But let's look at our industry, right? So for those of you who follow the Realtors Do a survey and we know that women make the vast majority of decisions on buying homes. So, hmm. How come the man always has the keys? Women are better, single women are better than single men at paying their mortgages. I don't know if you saw the state, the data. It was last year that it came out. Yet, our industry, we still have a long way to go. But I do believe progress is possible. And now is the time, because as Madeline Albright said, it took me quite a while to develop a voice, and now that I have it, I'm not gonna be silent. And doesn't it feel like that's the time we're in right now? People are listening to us, and people are listening to our issues. And so I think today, when we have this discussion, we're gonna cover topics that Desiree wanted me to make sure I brought to light. So Empower did a sexual harassment survey within its community. So this was only during women in the communities jobs in this industry. So we didn't want to know if something happened when they worked at Macy's, right? We wanted to know, well, you've been in the mortgage finance industry. Have you experienced sexual harassment? We also provided the EEOC definition of what sexual harassment meant so that we knew everybody was at least going to answer the survey with the same definition. And here's what we found. One more. All right. 75% of the women who filled out the survey within the Empower community had experienced workplace sexual harassment. The most frequent lo location was in the office and inappropriate comments were the most frequent um, violation. Unfortunately, more than 50% reported at least one incident of inappropriate touching and just under 50% of unwanted sexual advances. And those who had experienced workplace sexual harassment, only 8% had reported it to someone and only 20% ever told anyone in their chain of command. Nearly 60% said the reason they didn't report it was they feared professional repercussions. And 52% stated they actually went to a meeting after hours with a coworker who had previously made them uncomfortable because they feared that it would have a negative impact on their career. We want to be safe, seen, and celebrated. And when you realize that women are doing things that make them uncomfortable because they're afraid in their workplace, it's going to be held against them if they don't. That doesn't feel very safe. And so it was only a snapshot, right? The Empower community doesn't represent the entire industry, so by no way am I saying this represents the entire industry. And we had a 14% response rate, which is pretty good since it was the week before Christmas. And so we decided, let's just test the data. So we had three large conferences, and in each one, we did live polling at the end of our event. One was for the commercial multifamily space, one was for our IMB space, and one was in servicing. So three different audiences within the um, real estate finance industry. The data held up. 
almost to the percentage point. But we asked one additional question. We asked if you were a victim of workplace sexual harassment, how did it make you feel? And that came up. That was the first word, word cloud that came up. Oh, there it is. So I think the imbalance of power is something we're gonna to touch on today and learn how to navigate. And men and women need to work together to reverse this trend. But there was a sign of hope. Now that we're talking about this and we've put voice in it, that our respondents said, given what's going on in this environment, they are more likely to report an incident going forward. So at least everybody raising awareness is making a difference. And so um, we need to be part of the solution. I'm gonna go quickly through this since I've been talking longer than I anticipated. So these are some of the things we can work together on, right? We can be mentors. We can have look for true sponsors. Making sure women are in, not only in the meetings, but in those really important meetings. Company boards, making sure we're listening when people talk. And the number of opportunities that are out there, making sure you, all your employees, not just the person who you think you want to hire for the job if it's an internal candidate, but all have opportunities to apply for the job. So at MBA, we have a lot going on in diversity, and we've actually started our own internal diversity work group that's called MBA at Work, and they're doing a lot of great things, professional development, personal development. But if you haven't been on the MBA website and you want to know how your organization stands up in the world of diversity and inclusion, there's a self-assessment tool. And I encourage all of you who are leaders to take it and give you some data on how your organization is standing up. So, oh, hello, back, 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 back. <laughs> so, I don't know how many of you saw the 60 Minutes interview with Mark Beninoff. He's an impressive guy. And I wanna show you a little bit about what happened. Can we click so the video starts? A tech company called Salesforce is the perfect example of just how tough it can be to close the remaining pay gap. Salesforce is huge, 30,000 employees, $10 billion in annual revenue, and it was just ranked by Fortune as the number one best place to work among big companies. That helps explain why founder and CEO Mark Benioff was so cocky when the woman who runs his human resources department came to talk to him about equal pay back in 2015. So when Cindy Robbins came to you and said, you know we may have a problem with unequal pay in the company, what was your reaction? Well, said, that's not possible here. You know, it's, it's not possible. Why was it impossible? It's impossible because we have a great culture here. We're a, we're a best place to work. And we don't do that kind of thing. We don't play shenanigans, pay people paying people unequally. It's unheard of, it's crazy. Crazy because Benioff had already made promoting and retaining women a priority at Salesforce. But personnel chief Cindy Robbins says he never ordered an audit to make sure men and women were being paid equally. And what I told Mark was, the one thing we can't do is do the assessment, look under the hood, see a big dollar sign, and shut the hood. So we saw several years ago, we had a pay discrepancy. You remember we talked about that. And we made a pay adjustment. We raised our salaries for women $3 million. Then all of a sudden, two years later, we ran the same queries on the same database, looking at the same information, and guess what? We had another $3 million discrepancy. Mm. How could that be? Well, we had bought a couple dozen companies. Yeah. And when you buy a company, you not only get all their technology and their management team, guess what else you get? You their get their scales. problems. You get their problems, too. <laughs> you get their problems, get their and problems. they have pay problems, because those problems are out there. And of course, then we have to re-equalize and make those changes again. And you know that, that's where we are. There's no finish line when it comes to equality. Right? So not everyone has Mark in their corner. So this information was released in March as part of um, International Women's Day. 
and it shows, you'll hear on average, women make 80 cents for every dollar a man makes, but it's really more alarming when you break it out by which women are getting paid, and the average lifts all of them up, but if you're a Latina woman, on average, you're making 54 cents. Now that may not be someone in this room, but there are many Latina women out there that are getting paid 54 cents to the dollar. So we need to keep looking at pay for women, and I don't know if any of you are in a position to find out or ask your company if they've done a gender audit. I encourage you to do so. Um, it's data, and as they said, the one thing you can't do is find out you have a problem and then not deal with it. So again, I think that's something we can ask our employers, see what they, if they support us on doing that. So in our industry, this is S&P Finance and Insurance. This is the best data I could find on women make up 56% of the workforce and only 6.8% ever break through the glass ceiling. And as you'll see, the higher up you go, the fewer and fewer women. And it's not because women aren't out there. That's why we have to make sure we're doing everything we can to create opportunity. And part of what we're gonna talk about today is how we talk together, right? Not just women talking to women, but how do women and men in their organizations talk to one another about what's going on? And so Joanne Lippman, who wrote That's What She Said, and it's a book about how men and women in the workplace need to communicate. And she gave us some helpful hints. She said, interrupt the interrupters. Women are three times more likely to be interrupted than men. Use amplification and brag buddies. So Tamara's in a meeting, she says something and somebody talks over her or whatever, and then my job is to say, wait, I wanna hear Tamara's point, or Tamara made that point, easy to do. And I'm pretty sure we all believe that we have diverse candidates that come in, but have we had diversity in the people interviewing the candidates that come in? So she said, make sure those who are doing the screening and interviewing are diverse as well. And so I thought that's a good tip. And then she said, don't be afraid of tears. So for the men in the room who haven't given feedback because they're afraid a woman's gonna cry, or that they're afraid to have a difficult conversation. A woman is probably crying out of anger or frustration, not because you've hurt her feelings. And a lot of times, what Joanne found in her research is women aren't getting the feedback they need in order to continue to grow and improve because men are afraid it's gonna hurt their feelings. It doesn't hurt our feelings. We might be pissed, but it doesn't hurt our feelings because we might be frustrated with something, but at least you open up the conversation. And then this is one of my favorites. Yeah, that's not a compliment. So what do we mean by that? Well, believe it or not, in this day and age, and you would think it's on my LinkedIn profile that I'm the founder of Empower. Oh, where are we? This was in my LinkedIn feed. So, it's been so many years, so happy you're still in a position that suits your intelligence, still looking great, girl. That was a year ago. I didn't even respond, it didn't even like, I kind of just let it fly by. Then, last week, on Monday, Lord, you get prettier and prettier as time goes by. Then, freaked me out, I was sitting with Jamika in um, Texas, sad face, no response? Like, seriously? <laughs> I removed his name, and he's lucky I removed his name. But I, I don't know, am I supposed to be flattered? Because I wonder if he's friends with David, is he saying, dude, you're looking good today. <laughs> I like your shirt, David. I don't think so. And so, 
I, I don't know where to go with that. And we do like compliments, you know? You have a nice dress on, somebody says, hey, man, that's great. That's not a compliment. So anyway, today our panel is gonna talk about all the things that I've been highlighting. So I hope um, if you're not a member of Empower, it's free. You have a little card that will tell you how to join the community. And now I'm gonna introduce my panelists. So if you will join me on stage, David Robin is president and CEO of Wintrust Mortgage. Now, instead of reading all of this stuff, he's a great guy, he's really engaged, he manages all this stuff. What I can tell you about David is he sought me out at the annual convention. We happened to be in the same meeting. Um, and he came right over to me, introduced himself, and said, I'm giving you my card because I want to get involved with Empower. And then I saw him at our Consumer Affairs Advisory Council meeting. He came up to me and he goes, I have a story to tell you. And I'm going to let you tell it about your daughter. And he started telling me what he's doing in his company to close the gender gap and raise awareness. So that's when I decided we always knew we needed, we need the support of strong male leaders. But somebody who's walking the walk and talking the talk like David, and he lives in Chicago, I'm like, let's get him on stage and have him help us figure out some of the great things you're doing. So please welcome David to the stage. <laughs> Tamara King, who is my colleague at MBA. Tamara not only works in residential policy, so she understands what levers you need to push in order to make sure what goes on with the regulators, hopefully is the least disruptive and most supportive for the industry. She also champions our member engagement support. So when we have committees and councils and groups, Tamara is on point to make sure those groups are impactful, that they have the right folks on them. And she leads our diversity council, which reports up to the board of directors. So please welcome Tamara King. <laughs> Stacy, where's Stacy Ranke? Stacy has been in mortgage banking since 2001 and does client relations, business development, and she's currently vice president of client relations for Gurner and Kearns. But what, she's, what Stacy's gonna talk to you about when um, I start the session is how she's been treated in the workplace when battling an illness which I just, I respect you so much after hearing your story, and I guarantee you, you're gonna to need to pick your jaws up off the floor, because she has, we all talk about various ways that people may have been discriminated against, but when you're ill and you're fighting for your life, to have your employer discriminate against you is really, I think, out of all horrific, horrific. So Stacy, please join us on stage and thank you for being here. And Rebecca Steele. So Rebecca's been in the news. She just got a new job. She's chief operating, oh well, you were chief operating officer for your consulting firm, um, firm Spring EQ. But you just, and this is not updated, are CEO of your new organization. And FCC. So this was done before that was on your resume. So congratulations. Rebecca also has a very unique story to share. After being a leader and a female and navigating the housing crisis while trying to do everything right and people really um, taking advantage, I think, of the fact that you are a woman is the best way to describe it. So she has an amazing story to tell, and we're so delighted you're here, Rebecca. Come on up. So what we're going to do is I'm going to start out with a few questions, and then Desiree is going to jump up. And she will take the mic around if you want to ask a question or if you want to make a point. This is supposed to be a conversation. So we'll get it started, but feel free. If you have a question you want to ask, raise your hands and, and we will do our best to address it. So ladies and gentlemen, it's the first time I've gotten to say that. Um, can you share a little bit about yourself and your story? David. You want me to start? Yes. See if my mic's on. Can you hear me? 
Okay. So as Marcia said, I'm David Robin, and I'm here in Chicago, and I run the mortgage operation for Wintrust Mortgage. We're part of Wintrust Financial. Um, it's a $28 billion bank holding company. Um, but I was born and raised in Columbus, Ohio, and I moved to Colorado Springs for a couple years, to Detroit for a couple years, and have been here ever since. Um, met my wife about a year after moving to Chicago. Uh, we've had two daughters that are now grown. You probably have seen in the bio section a little bit about my background, but just the cliff notes, we have about 1,100 employees in the mortgage operation, and I've been the CEO there since 2007. Um, about my story, uh, I would say the best way to describe it is that um, I've always been around strong women my entire life. Um, it starts with my mother. Uh, interesting story I'll share with you that I just learned um, about two years ago when she passed away. We had always heard that she um, finished high school young and that she finished college young. And we just always assumed it was because she was bright. But that wasn't the reason. She was four years old when she started first grade. And the reason she started first grade is her older brother needed help with his overalls when he went to the bathroom. And so my mother was asked to, to join him in school so that she could help him. Well, she's sitting in class with him, and she started doing the coursework. One thing led to another, and she graduated high school at 15 with her brother and then went on to graduate college from SMU at the age of 18. And you might ask the question, why did she finish in three years versus four? And again, it speaks to some of her strength and resiliency because she always felt like she was someone's little sister. She always felt like she didn't belong. And so she figured out another way to get from here through the challenges and to graduate. My wife graduated of uh, MBA from Northwestern. My oldest daughter has a Harvard master's degree. She finished with a 4.0. I'm the, I'm the flunky in the family. Um, and so I've always been around uh, um, strong women. My youngest daughter just finished her master's degree in, at University of Michigan in architecture school. And for those of you who know what architects go through, it's akin to going through medical school. So for people in my position who are male that are approaching this topic and view women as um, something other than a person, something other than an employee, has never resonated for me. I just don't get it, but I see it, I live it, I've witnessed it. And so as Marsha, as I, she and I talked about, this is not something that is just a topic for me, it's personal for me. So, there you go. Awesome, thanks. Tamara? So, so I grew up primarily in Washington, D.C., so I assumed that I was going to get a good, good Ooh. That I would get a good federal job like most of the people who um, I grew up with because that's what you did. I, as Marcia mentioned, I never thought at all about being into the, in the financial industry. My father was actually very instrumental in making sure, I'm an only child by the way, that I knew how to do everything a girl and a your son would be able to do because as he said, we don't know if you're gonna get married, so you must be able to do everything. We have to prepare you for whatever comes along. So I was taught how to do everything, but I never assumed that I would be in the financial services industry. Um, but I ended up getting an English literature, public policy degree, and started my career actually in New York City, um, working in the city government. Stayed in New York for a while, married my husband in New York, found my way back to Washington, D.C., um, and started working at Fannie Mae. I started Fannie Mae when Frank Rains was there, um, so it, it has been a while, but it actually kind of quickly took a turn to the left or right, I guess it depends on what you say, but we got into the statement really quickly, so most of my career at Fannie Mae was actually during a very turbulent time. Um, about 10 years ago, though, I, I couldn't take the turbulence, and I found my way to the Mortgage Bankers Association, which I have to say I love, and it's a pretty nice, sweet spot for me. It's about 140 or so employees. It's a nice size. I love the issues that we work on, but really most importantly, I love the fact that as part of my job, I get to do really important work um, on diversity and inclusion issues. 
So uh, it, it's, it's been a great ride. The one thing I will say in terms of sort of what do I do for fun, I am a mother of a 14-year-old and twin nine-year-olds. So pretty much my so that is my social life. <laughs> I do not have free time, but it's been great. Hi, my name is Stacy. I'm Stacy Ranke. I'm currently Vice President of Client Relations for Gerner and Kearns Law Firm. Um, prior to that, I was a Vice President of Client Relations for a company in our industry. And um, as luck would have it, I ended up being one of eight and got diagnosed with breast cancer last um, November. Um, there were a lot of weird things like, we need you to go on FMLA, we filled out the paperwork when you came back from surgery, and um, things that didn't seem right to me, but um, I had a very wise mentor that kind of was coaching me on the side and just said, you know, just roll with it. Um, and then they decided that it would be a great idea to let me go my first day of radiation. Um, so I went home and sat on the couch for about two days because I'm very work driven and besides the fact that now I'm battling cancer, I'm looking at no job um, and certainly the financial ramifications of that. Um, it, it did allow me some time, I think, to, to determine what I really wanted to do. And I will say that in, in the sense that I feel like I've gone from fearful to fearless, um, the breast cancer has been a gift. And I've tried to look at all the things that have changed to make that impact on my life because it's a lot. I'm um, the mother of three beautiful daughters. I am the nene of five and three quarters grandbabies. One's due in about six weeks and they are my life. I have a wonderful husband. My sister's here with me today um, and I've got a great support staff. And when I couldn't really rally about what I was gonna do with this, um, I championed to get the radi radiation um, at 7.30, so I wouldn't miss work, didn't want to miss any meetings, and the first day I went to radiation in heels and a suit, and the second day I went to radiation in Ugg boots and yoga pants, and as I'm telling them, you know, I'm sorry I took that, that time frame, they said, we wish this was the only time we heard that story, and then it was college teachers, bankers, work people, because you're in the fight of your life, and you have no idea what the path ahead of you is and you're you don't really have the energy to uh, i think battle for yourself you're you've got everybody else battling for you but my very wise mentor who is kathleen mitchell formerly of, of freddie mac said if you won't do it for you i know you're going to do it for the other women and, and that's true because i've always been certainly with three daughters and almost four granddaughters, and, and even my grandsons. We talk all the time about what is different about boys and girls. Well, we look different, but we can absolutely do the same things. And I think that we're at a time where it's really important for us to raise our voices, because I could have not shared about the cancer. I mean, you've got to go back and forth in your head. What's everybody going to think? Oh my gosh, how are they going to treat me? But at the end of the day, if we don't share our stories, then no one else is gonna know that they're not the only one. And Stacy, if I remember correctly, you worked with your boss for 17 years? We had been friends for friend. 17 years. Well, she calls it a friend. I'm not sure <laughs> I call him. He did say on the way out the door, of course, this won't affect our friendship. I smartly kept my mouth shut. Right, but not even to have a conversation with you. Mm -hmm. You were called in like with HR and? No, nope, no HR. I got in, uh, it was supposed to be a client overview meeting. So as I'm giving my updates, pretty soon it was, well, we're gonna let you exit this gracefully. And that's kind of how we went down that path. Told you. Rebecca. Wow. I know, sorry, you have to follow. Yeah. <laughs> no, but yours is pretty amazing, amazing. too. Yeah. Um, well, I have been in financial services for about 22 years, and it's my second career, so I'll just give you a little bit of that, back, that background. I'm actually a chemical engineer, and I did chemical engineering for about seven years and went back and got my master's in international finance and somehow made it to mortgage banking. How, how that happens, I still don't know, but um, I, 
I really want to focus on sort of the, the issue that uh, came about during the housing crisis. So during the housing crisis, or right before it, I had been running originations, retail originations and portfolio at Chase. And I left Chase in 2006, actually February 26, 2006, to go to a uh, company far away on the West Coast called Countrywide. Um, I was living in New Jersey at the time and working in New Jersey, New York, and I thought it was a great idea. I had already turned them down three times, and they kept saying, come, 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 we need a good, great chief operating officer. So I came out and started my new job on day one, and I walk into a conference room at Countrywide in Pasadena, and there are 12 guys, all mostly to my senior, sitting around, and essentially not saying anything to me. I walk in the conference room, I'm here to help you guys turn this around, we're gonna do some, some changes with subprime, and we're gonna start up a new prime business, and I'm here to help, and I was very excited about it. Um, and then I started thinking to myself, wow, this is gonna be a little more challenging than I thought. Uh, long story short, uh, we did end up, and everyone knows the story around Countrywide, um, I did interview with Bank of America and was accepted to run their Bank of America's new combined retail origination, and that was in 2008. So I had about 2,500 salespeople uh, working for me, and we were just going gangbusters with all the changes in the technology between Countrywide and Bank of America. Well, why do I tell you this? Because I loved that job and was doing great and felt like I was in a better place. Bank of America had more women, it was more diverse, I was on the Corporate Diversity Council, and I thought I was really making a difference. Um, in 2009, Bank of America continued to have problems, so I, they called me and asked me to fly back from, I had like a vacation the first time in like four years, and I flew back to meet with Barbara DeSore, who I really loved working with, um, and basically said, hey look, servicing isn't going so great. We have 12 million customers and two million of them are delinquent and we need you to come over to servicing, default servicing, and fix this problem. Well, I said to the small group, Barbara included, I don't know anything about servicing. I really don't. And this is a pretty big crisis. So they said, don't ever say that again. You're gonna go in there, you're gonna fix it. We're gonna, you know, we'll support you. So anyway, three years later, Basically, I had worked on the foreclosure crisis, I had worked on the modifications, I had testified in front of Congress, I had done everything that Bank of America needed me to do, and I just said, basically, I'm tired, I, I need a new gig. So, I, I actually left and went back to Chase. That's where the story really starts. The story was, I then found myself in the middle of a massive problem. A whistleblower lawsuit, that had come about from the countrywide underwriting director uh, and the Department of Justice, i.e. Preet Bahara, combined to sue me personally for the mortgage crisis. So you look back and say, well, how can this be? I've only been in, you know, I was at Countrywide for 18 months before this thing went down. And then I, I recall back looking at the boardroom when I walked in in Pasadena and thinking I know exactly how this happened because there wasn't another name on that list. They sued Bank of America, Countrywide, and Rebecca Marone was my name at the time. It's Rebecca Steele now uh, for over a billion dollars. Um, so I basically said this is not right. I am going to fight this. And I actually ended up going to court in the Southern District of New York with a full jury for 30 days. And I was actually found uh, in charge of fine of a million dollars. So it didn't go the way I wanted it to go. It was very political, politically heated. Um, so we right away, Bank of America, myself, and Countrywide went and we basically said, we're going to appeal this to the Second Circuit and we actually won fabulously in the Second Circuit. In fact, the three judges that were on the panel basically said to the government and to Preet Bahara, this should have never gone to trial, this was wrong, and they were quoting common law from 1800s that they had violated as a part of that. So I'm here today to tell you that 
that is probably the hardest thing that I've ever been through. Um, and I learned a lot of lessons from that. And one of the things that's very, very difficult is uh, the people who leave you. I knew I was right. I knew that I had done nothing wrong and the facts were behind me. But if you Google my name and you put Bank of America next to it, what you're gonna find is a lot of bad, ugly stuff. Like the blonde go-getter is fined a million dollars um, and other such things. Not about me as a business person, about me as being a woman and being the face now still, some say, of the mortgage crisis, which is not true. So Desiree was one of those people who didn't run for me. She ran to me. And I'll be forever grateful for the very few people who came to support me. Um, I'm here to give back. It's a lesson learned. I'm not running for the mortgage business. I think I have a lot more to add value here. And um, that's actually why I'm here and a part of uh, this organization and other organizations. Um, I just most recently was unanimously nominated to uh, uh, the National Foundation for Credit Counseling. Um, and their biggest topic that they talked about was my lawsuit, right? So they got over it, they see the value, and now I'm here to help others with, with similar things, so. Thanks, Rebecca. Before I move on to additional questions, does anybody have a follow-up question or something they wanna ask after hearing the stories? Okay, so we're gonna dive in. So Tamara, what have you experienced in the workplace that has influenced your view of gender equality? So there are actually many stories that I could probably pull from, and I'm sure that you all could as well, but I'm going to actually start with one that has stayed with me because it happened a while ago, but it, but it, it still stays with me and I remember it very vividly. And, but as I mentioned to you, I started my career in um, New York City, and so one of my earlier jobs um, I sat in this bank of cubicles, this, you know, pretty typical you know, bank of cubicles. Um, no, it was just names, it was no titles, no ranks or anything, it was just cubicles and, and names. But it never failed that I would have men walk through the bank of cubicles and come to my cubicle and ask me to do the administrative work. It was always, oh, the copiers the copier's down, or how do I do this, or here are my exp expense reports, which was ridiculous. And there were always, and because again, so people had to walk through this bank of cubicles and find me to ask me to do that. Um, there was this one guy who just, just could not get it um, through his mind that that was not my role. And the thing that made it most interesting, out of that bank of cubicles, I was the one who had actually the highest title, if you had seen my title. I had also had the most education um, from all of those, from, from everybody there, but they passed through the other men, the other white women, and there was a couple of Hispanics to find me to, make, to ask for me to do the administrative work. Um, I say that because that is um, something that stuck with me, that still sticks with me, because even now, um, I think going into certain meetings and certain, they, there's always an assumption that clearly or that you know, she's probably not the person in charge. Um, so there's always, to me, kind of that constant need and to, to make sure that, that either I, I purposely try to sit at the head of the table or I'm very mindful of, of ways I carry myself because I know the perception, unfortunately, um, is, is that I'm, I'm probably not the person in charge. Rebecca, do you want to share what influenced your experiences with gender bias? Yeah, I actually... In addition actually, to what happened to Well, yeah, the countrywide thing, that was yeah. really awful. Um, but even before that, I mean, being a chemical engineer and, and always sort of working in a man's world, I always thought, I'm gonna put on thick skin and I'm just gonna go in there and I know there's a glass ceiling and I'm gonna break through the hat and I'm gonna do my best. Um, well, I got to the mortgage business and the interesting thing was I would actually get notes uh, from the guys, because I was a fairly high, I was a vice president and a senior vice president. I would get notes and newspaper articles and things just dropped on my desk that basically said what to wear, appropriate wear at meetings and uh, similar things like that. And I, I, I couldn't tell who the writing was. I would just sort of put it away and think like why, why, and then I noticed myself going into meetings 
feeling bad about like who's doing that, why are they doing that to me? And, and it goes back, Marcia, to the powerless thing. They're trying to, even though I'm a powerful personality, they're trying to cut that power down. And that's when I really first started, and that was early on in my, probably my late 20s. And hasn't gotten a lot better, I'll be honest with you, in the mortgage business since there, so. Is there anything you wanna add, David, or I? Yeah, I would, and it was interesting because a couple of these comments came up earlier today. I think, Marcia, you referenced on one of the slides that 51% of the U.S. workforce are women, and I was having a conversation earlier today with one of our employees here, Stephanie, and she said she worked at a company in 1991, and they had roughly 80-some loan officers but only three women loan officers. And I, I've been in the business since 1985, and I've seen roles that have been largely dominated, if not exclusively, from the majority standpoint, by men, and other roles largely dominated by women. And as the old adage goes, sometimes it takes your kids to teach you to question things and to learn from things. And this is something that I learned from my daughter who very early on, she, um, not open or loud, she questions things internally and you can see her wheels spinning. And she always wondered why some of her friends growing up in elementary school were really gifted in math or gifted in sciences. And then all of a sudden they seemed to sort of drift away and started going into more of the humanities and the social sciences. And she said, I, I didn't understand it because they seemed like AP students, the top of the class. And it wasn't like they just dumbed down. What happened? So it was when she was a sophomore in college, she got a group together in order to write a paper, and it was a thesis that gave them an opportunity to have a living arrangement, so that was sort of the impetus behind it. But they really sort of wondered why it is that women go and sort of separate from men in terms of their interest in math and sciences, the STEM subjects. And so they did a research assignment, and I found it fascinating, and I shared this with Marcia. And that is that they found that teachers typically in math and sciences will write on a board, they'll write formulas, they'll write equations, they'll write things that you have to memorize. And in doing so, the teacher turns their back to the class. For a guy, hey, that's great, whatever. But subconsciously, it became an issue for women feeling like he's just turned his back to me. And so all of a sudden, there sort of becomes this narrative that a girl is interested in achieving in my math or sciences class because I just want a good grade. And so the teacher gives very one word short answers to the questions. But yet the men in the, or the boys in the class would ask a question and they'd get this long narrative answer because felt like he was really interested in the subject. And so a long story short, they engaged with an elementary school or a middle school with sixth graders in Nashville, Tennessee and told the teachers about this concept and said, we want to give you some feedback on the do's and don'ts as it, rate, as it relates to teaching girls about how to keep them engaged versus disengaging them. And the teachers were in disbelief until the end of the semester when they found out that the girls were actually skyrocketing in the STEM classes. And they've stayed in touch with them to this day and found out many of them have gone on to pursue careers in math and sciences, chemical engineering being an example of that. And so that clearly illustrated to me that it can start very early on in somebody's development in terms of seeing where they belong and where they don't or where they're included just by simply the paradigms that we have to learn how to meet people on where they show up and ways that people interact with each other. And we're different and you have to understand that. So. It's an example of how complex some of these issues are, right? Just in the way that boys and girls can learn differently or what they're seeing on their TV screen, as I talked about. So they're complex, but they're not insurmountable. And Stacy, I know you've done some things to kind of bridge the gender divide. Can you talk about this? Sure. 
You know, for a long time, um, myself and one of my girlfriends had talked about the fact that when we would go to networking events, um, it was basically get a cocktail, sit with the people you knew, have a couple drinks, and then leave. And there really was not anything needy for us as females. Um, there might be, you know, a variety of both males and females there, but there was nothing significant for us. Um, and there really wasn't in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. So we talked about this for about 13 years. And then um, in October, I finally, I went to the Empower event and I called Tony while I was in my room and said, oh my gosh, we're doing this. We are gonna do this because now's the time to do it. Then unfortunately, I had a little hiccup in November that put me kind of in a whole nother path to do that. And as I was sitting at home, I thought, you know, it, you have a lot of interesting thoughts when you face your mortality. It's, you know, what do, you, what do I want to say to the girls? What do I want to tell the grandbabies? What do I want to say to my husband? But then um, I love this industry and I've been in it um, and kind of grown up in it. And so I, I started thinking, what am I going to do for the industry? So um, I actually booked a speaker, booked the place, and then I called Tony and said, we're doing this. We're doing this in May. So we launched in May of 2018. Um, we have a variety of somewhere between 15 to 25 women, and our format's different. And what we really wanted to do was give women from associate level up through uh, the senior executive level the ability to hear from someone in our industry that is a female. Because often we only hear from the males um, unless we're at an empower event. <laughs> So um, the first conference, we had Jill Helmer speak, or the first meeting, we had Jill Helmer speak. Cheryl Travis Johnson spoke for us, um, Kim Evans, and then we have uh, our upcoming meeting will be um, a speaker from Freddie Mac. But the format is we network for an hour, and then we listen to our speaker, and typically they're speaking about mentoring, um, something they wish they would have learned earlier in their career, um, how to kind of navigate the bumps in the roads being female. And um, then we eat dinner together. And it is, the, you know, I wasn't really sure what anybody thought, but they love that format because we're all just talking. It doesn't matter if you're an SVP and a supervisor or what your role is. It's that we all have common experiences and there's not a lot of us that talk. So, um, Women's Mortgage Banking Collective is, is um, alive and well, and we're, we're moving forward. I actually I typically like to do everything in order, um, but I finally said, okay, well, we don't have a logo. We're just going to roll with it, and we'll be launching that next week. Um, but I think it's important for us as women um, to be there to help guide the next generation. There's a lot of things that happen at the conferences, we all know. Um, and it, it's not just a party because your clients are there. So there's a lot of things that I think we miss because there's so much of the next generation who don't have mentors um, and don't really even know how to find a mentor. Um, and that's always been part of, of my, my career and how I've grown. So uh, that's been something that I've really been focused on is trying to give back. Can I just add to that? Because I think that's a really good point around mentors. I mean, I have informally mentored a lot of women and, and made it my a point whenever I took a, a, a new position or whether it was a promotion or a lateral to make sure when I reevaluated my group, which was generally mostly men, <laughs> that we always look to up, you know, bring women into the conversation and into the group and, and promote them. And I really think that that is really, really important. It's, it's, making a conscientious effort to have the best person for the role, but with the flavor of making sure we have diversity. And it has really helped me in my career. I don't think I would be where I am today without the strong women that I've hired and promoted through the years that now are at SVPs at Wells or Chase or other places. I'm really proud of that. And I think that is one thing that we can all do to make a difference. So, Tamara, what kind of behaviors do you think make a difference in the workplace? Because your story about walking through the cubes and passing all the people, obviously, that's behavior you've had to overcome. But what other kinds of behaviors do you think make a difference in the workplace? Right. And so one of the biggest um, 
things that I had to learn and that I often take, say to um, the people in my office is you have to be willing to raise your hand and to speak up. Uh, this one of the biggest obstacles that I, I see with women is that if there's a project that we want and we know is, is, is a big project, we know it's important to the company, we wait to be asked and we don't say, I want that or I would be good on that, at that. I should have that, I should be part of it. And then I, I hear many stories and it's, it's really, um, it really it kind of breaks my heart. It's, it hurts me when I hear women who say, I, you know, I should have been on that, but nobody asked me to that meeting. They didn't ask me to be part of that project. Um, and so then eventually what happens often is they shut down. And they do their job enough because they don't want to be fired, but they do literally what's required of them. And I think it's really sad because one, they're not fulfilling, getting fulfilled for themselves, but also the job is actually not getting the best employee as well. And so what I have, have learned to do, because quite honestly, you're not gonna be asked all the time, and you, you, probably, you may not, so that you have to be willing to say, I want that. And if you get the answer of no, one, I want a good explanation. It can't just be no. I need, I, need, I need to know why, because if it's something that I need to do to get myself better, I'm willing to put in the work and to do that. Um, but it really needs to be a good, good, good response. <laughs> why? Because you know, otherwise, and even still, I'm going to come back. And so you don't want to have the one no or one setback be the end of you trying. You want to keep at it. You want to keep raising your hand, and you want to keep speaking. that work well? I think that part of the problem is, uh, for me personally, was I was raised to be a nice girl. My parents were very conservative. You know, we couldn't talk to boys or they unplugged the phone. Um, and there were certain expectations. Um, and so as I went on and kept being nice, because you should be kind to people, um, then that was seen as a weakness. And the other thing that was seen as a weakness for me was that I'm a girly girl. You know, at first I used to try to apologize, change that, do things. It's just the way I am. Um, and my granddaughters all love it because then we can all wear heels together. So, you know, I think you have to really own who you are um, and not, not uh, apologize for it because you are unique to yourself. I mean, we're, we're all one in a million. There's no one else like you. So to try to conform and be what the industry wants you're not going to be happy and you're not going to be at your best. I'm so, I'm so glad you said that because I, I'm sitting up here and obviously I'm not sitting in the same shoes as most of you, right? And my initial reaction to that question is, is be you. And I have seen people that I have had challenges with in managerial roles and I've pulled them aside and said, why did you approach the situation that way? Why were you with such sharp elbows? Why were you so aggressive? And what I learned is that they were trying to emulate the way a man would approach that situation. And I don't think we're ever our best and our strongest when we're trying to be someone else. I've heard people say, to be afraid to cry. Horse hockey, be yourself. You know, that's, that's my message. And so I applaud you saying that because I think that that's the best way to be your best. Yeah, I would just say that is really, really hard to do. Um, just the, the, the position I had before, uh, before this last one as a COO of a startup company, I basically was working with about 21 men. And you know, when the board comes in, the board's all men, you know, it's really hard. I had to work hard, even though I've had all these experiences, to really have my voice heard. And sometimes I felt like I did it wrong. Sometimes I felt like, maybe I'm to your point, like maybe I'm just too aggressive, but I really felt shut down. And for those of you who have been in that situation, probably all of you have felt like that. It's a terrible feeling. You don't feel a part of the team. You don't feel like you're contributing. You start to doubt, doubt yourself. I mean, after everything that I've done, for me to now feel that way still, it's like a work in progress every day. I have to remind myself that it's okay to do that. Can I add one thing? Because what you said re really resonated with me. I mean, similarly, um, you know, I was told, I was taught very well, very well and very often to be polite, girls don't do this. But even um, kind of more importantly is you don't mess up a good job 
you have a job and it's a good job and you have benefits, you don't mess that up. <laughs> and so you don't want to be the one to rattle the cage or to you know, make, um, you know, make a lot of noise because you want to keep your good job. I came, so I mentioned that I grew up in Washington, D.C., but I actually spent a lot of time in my extended family is from rural Florida. Um, so dirt roads kind of Florida. So my job was a good job. You don't, you don't mess that up. You don't mess with that. So I think, but to your point, what I think is really important is trying to find what works for you. So for me, I am not the person who's going to pound the table at a meeting or um, be very challenging necessarily in public. However, I will very quickly I will go into boss, my boss's office and say, can I speak to you for a minute? I don't like how this ha what happened here. Or I will, I will definitely make sure that I say something within a timely basis because I want to make sure he remembers it <laughs> and like not say I, I've forgotten what happened. Um, so I had to find what works for me. So I, I think that was a good point. Desiree. Right. Am I on? I can make a couple comments. These are all great. How many of you know someone who, and I can make a statement, how many of you know someone who's been affected by a countrywide or Bank of America short sell? Rebecca Steele is the woman who went into the room to negotiate the short sales to get that done. How many tents did you put up across the nation? How many tents did you put across the home ownership tents? to get them to oh, go around the nation? Oh, we did about 250 across the nation. The reason, thank you, the reason I brought that up, it was the difference of whether it was she gonna do it or her job to go get that done. And the reason I think she has the power to do that is because of the complex engineering she got from chemical processes. It's how you put it together, it was problem solving. She knew it was a problem, and she did it. And you're just talking about one out of 21 to go into the, with the guys. That's so much smaller than what you took on in the whole nation. And yet you had an impact. The second thing I want to talk about, Stacy, I know all <laughs> is Stacy had the gentleman recruit her to come work there and then turn on her about her early term, uh, to terminate because of the fact that she reported she had cancer. So the idea is, is that we go down a list and to Marsha, how does that impact if she's starting that power? Is it really the right thing for you to do? So for all of us to get on the stage and talk about this, is there an innermost feelings and have a guy in here, I think is fantastic for the perspective of how he thinks about it versus on how us women think about it. Because we all think about it differently. So my question to everyone in the audience supposed to be engaging. If someone doesn't ask a question, I will start putting the mic in front of your face. <laughs> I have to no, know, as, as, as uh, Marshall will tell you, I have no bones about going up and saying, get my ass, because I have nothing to lose. And everyone who's ever been interviewed by me has always revealed something that they've never told anyone else. I have a natural life now. <laughs> so, when you get to a point, please ask questions so I can make sure that we get Okay, I just like to talk about one thing that happened recently that I thought was kind of interesting. Um, as we were building this home equity sales force with mortgage loan officers, and I was running the sales force. And I had gone to my boss and the HR and head of recruiting and basically said, look, I know it's not easy to find women loan officers, but I'm telling you they're out there. And when you find them, they're way better than the guys. <laughs> so let's go find some. Point blank looked at me and said, that's not, that's going to take too long. So one of the reasons why I'm not there anymore is because I didn't feel like I was getting the support to have the right, not only decision making, but have women in the sales force uh, as loan officers that, that would get supported. So I just find that appalling. And I don't think that that's unique in small mortgage companies. And if we don't take a stand to really make a change, no one will. So I think we have a big job ahead of us, and there's a lot of those types of companies out there. Any questions? 
Poor Desiree. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> But if you have a lot of mentors for different reasons, different purposes, men, women, technical, financial, operations, whatever it is that you think you need, broadening out those um, mentors, I think has really helped me a lot. Verse 7, 1, D. So you have 20 people to go to. And every situation is a little bit different. So you're going to want to have someone that you can talk to about certain things in certain instances. I just make that as a suggestion. One other thing I'd add to that is uh, my mentors are nothing like me. I am the go-go-getter, you know, client relations focused. I have one mentor who is total finance and it's all about the numbers and she's very one, two, three which is good for me because sometimes I need to get back on my path of one, two, three. And then I have another one who's really retired from the industry. Um, and so I get a perspective that I wouldn't get um, from someone that was still within the industry. So I think those are two good things to look for. You, you don't want them to be just like you because they're gonna have some really honest conversations with you and you need another perspective. 
And just one thing I would add, I was at a, an event recently with, um, she was retired, but she had very, very, um, she was actually president of a, com of a company, and um, it was a fireside chat. So it was a small room, and people could ask her whatever, and somebody asked her about mentors, but who is your mentor? And she actually said, it was interesting to me, she said, well, I never actually really had mentors, kind of in the traditional sense. She said, and she said, she was, she's an older, older woman who was in a really, to field and had, I could tell she had a hard time getting to her position. She said that since in lieu of mentors, I really made a point of studying people, of like really kind of, you know, of, of watching the people who I did want to be like, watching how they held themselves in meeting, watching how they conducted themselves, watching what they saw was important. So while yes, they are former mentors, um, there's also ways of, I'm gonna say getting the information that you would want maybe from a mentor, but not having that relationship. And it stuck with me because one of my early mentors took me around in meetings with her, and I'm so appreciative of this. I mean, I was really silent because she, she had a really high uh, position in New York State, New York State government at the time. And then afterwards, we would talk about that meeting, and she would say, do you see how that person did this? Do you know why that person did this? Like this was a, a mistake, he should, and, and so we actually would deconstruct the meeting because she was trying to teach me, you know, like look and observe. And so, um, I mean, I think I think mentors are important, but I also think sometimes you can get the information from from really being observant. Great feedback, Teresa. First, what a great panel. So this is fabulous, I think, and I just want to commend all of you for being there and also sharing all of these wisdom uh, with us. Uh, one of the things that I think I have found uh, as a Latina, number one, as a woman, is that one of our, 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 the biggest challenges that I have faced have not been necessarily with men, but with other women. Uh, I think that women, uh, especially a lot of Latinas, are very um, jealous and you know they try to hold you back. So I don't know, have you in your professions experienced that as well? I convince people to do the right thing, but if they're not gonna do the right thing, you're not going to change that person. So you have to stay the course, I don't know. Have you ever seen two mean girls together in a meeting? Uh, yeah, actually. Um, <laughs> as I've referenced my daughters a number of times, <laughs> I have to tell you, you guys are just not nice to each other in middle school. Oh, so no, middle school's, middle school's horrible, right? It's just awful. But having said that, I would put maybe a, a slightly different perspective on what Marsha just said, because I agree with it all the way up to a point, meaning that I think that a lot of people come to a situation with not being mean-spirited intention, but by habit or by experience. And so, if you really want to break through sharing a concern or a challenge or trying to get them to go a different way with you one time, you're probably not going to change a thought with them. Two times you're probably not going to get there. We have a consultant that we work with that is amazing. He talks about emotional intelligence. And he says that we're hardwired in many ways and that to change paradigms, you have to introduce things to people seven different times. And then that's with an asterisk. Seven times if you have the IQ of a genius, the rest of us take 21, right? And so don't give up quickly. Continue to push through it, and I think you can actually have some accomplishments even with some of the not so mean girls. So that has not been my experience. <laughs> um, you know, I think that there are, you know, I, I tell my daughters, mean girls grow up to be mean women just it, it doesn't go away and at first because before cancer i was you know i wanted everyone to be happy and i was a pleaser i would keep trying to build that relationship and build that relationship and every time i turn around there would be something going on um, and i think there's a lot of bullying and then you start feeling bad or you don't want to be in a situation because there's kind of that uh, very passive aggressive thing where they're hugging you and saying things in your ear. Um, and I think, you know, it, it really was interesting to me as I got on the other side of kind of getting perspective on um, my life uh, living every day is that now I just call them out and uh, their faces are usually shocked 
because nice girl Stacy never did that before. Um, but we have to start saying no, we're not gonna accept that as women. We are our own worst enemy because we don't say anything. And so I'd encourage you to, you know, obviously you wanna be respectful, but you know, Marsha and I talked about this the other day on the phone. My favorite uh, quote, which I tell my daughters all the time from the time they've been little is, people will show you who they are, believe them. Well, actually, I uh, just wanted to extend on this. And that, I think the one thing that's missing is women and minorities also um, run into this problem of thinking there's only enough spots for a few, and that's where the behavior comes from. You said, look around the room, you see you're one, you're the only one in the room, and that's been my experience for most of my life. And then when you know when they're bringing someone else in, you're probably on your way out because there's only enough room for one or and that's where that behavior comes from, that fear of being replaced. And so what we have to do is find ways to become more intentional about making sure all practices from succession planning to hiring is inclusive of everyone up front so that fear is diminished and then you embrace bringing it in because you benefit from it. So that, I think that's where it comes from. It's that there's never been enough room for, for multiples. It's like back to the mean girl thing. There's only going to be one cutest girl, the other prettiest girl in school, so you can't be with one too. <laughs> and that's where it starts. And it just it, it perpetuates itself into the workplace when you see there's only enough room for one or two. Yeah. That, that, I, I was just. Go ahead. All, all I was going to do really is underscore what you said, Cheryl, because that was where my head is. What went immediately was that the belief is if there are 10 spots, they're only, they're, they are only going to a lot one of them possibly <laughs> for a woman or an African or whatever. And so whoever has that spot is very fearful about losing that position. I mean, he or she probably knows how rare that is. Um, and so um, instead of being helpful, there's actually a hand pushing you away, which is very unfortunate. I was just gonna add that I have had the good fortune of working with a lot of high level women executives and unfortunately, not all of them will give back. That's, it's, it's very, very disappointing. Um, I try to encourage and, and get them here and lead by example, because I think it's incredibly important and the only way that we will see change. But, but um, they're just going to be there, and I guess those are the mean high-level girls. <laughs> So I have a question. Um, in the world, and I'll say in the C-suite world, I understand that people are hiring based on culture. This is our culture here, so it's very important that the person that they hire fit. So in light of someone being themselves, bringing them bringing their whole self to the table, being authentic, but yet that person doesn't fit the culture, how would you advise from the executive level down to the employee level, they work that out? Because I think sometimes employers can miss great employees because you don't act like us. But then you have the employee saying, but I need to be myself, but I have the skills. So can you guys speak to that, of how that marriage should happen, what it should look like in that convergence? I, I tra thank you. I, I translate that into one of the hardest things <clears throat> to do as a leader is to have a team that is going for a result and they may approach it differently than you would and that being okay. And so I think it's the same with the culture and the fit because if everyone is clear on the goals of the organization or of the project, then the people who are empowered to do that work should be able to do it in a way that they know will get the result that you're asking for, if that makes sense. 
But sometimes as leaders, we want to prescribe how you're going to get there. Like, don't forget you need to do X, Y, and Z. And I think in a culture, it's a little bit of the same way, right? Well, I don't know, all those piercings and tattoos, don't, I don't know. What will, what will the members say when someone comes in, right? That may be conscious or unconscious, so whether it's the way someone looks or the way someone talks, because sometimes uh, an accent can be thick, you want a leadership team that says, that doesn't matter, you said it when it started. Somebody should just be viewed as a person and a contributor, and not all of the other stuff that we put on, right? Because um, anybody who does unconscious bias training will tell you we're all biased, right? We're all biased. The biases we have may be different, but it's just a fact of life. And so how do we make sure we check those at the door? I think culture is incredibly important. And in fact, you know, we've tried to make more of an emphasis on hiring based on cultural alignment than technical alignment, because you feel like you can teach people um, certain aspects of what we do, but it's difficult to get somebody that is aligned with sort of your core operating principles, the things that you do when people aren't looking. It's the way that you embody integrity, the things that are important to you as a company or to the brand. What is your beacon or your shining light? And that's how we define culture. And I think people define culture differently, but to Marsha's point, having diversity in thought, having diversity in approach is powerful and helpful. Having a bunch of yes me or yes women is a disaster. And so having that diversity of thought is powerful, but not with people that are constantly trying to go a different direction from what you stand for as an organization, what your brand is about. I hope that makes some sense. But I do think it really speaks to, this is where I think leadership really in this area has to be personal and can't be left just to HR events or DNI consultants. I think they're great and I think you should have those too because they absolutely will reach some people. But I think this is where leaders will have to say if they notice that the same types of people are getting promoted um, are getting opportunities to shine at really important events, um, or being brought to important meetings. Why, why is that? Why am I seeing Dave and Bill all the time? Why am I seeing the same people all the time? And I think it, this is really where the personal touch has to come, come into play, where people have to say, well, wait a minute, what about Mary? What, like, what's going on over here? And they must challenge their, 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 their managers um, and, and really, I mean, I do say challenge because I've definitely been in situations where we've had hiring, situ hiring situations where there's been, you know, kind of our typical hire versus someone else. And it, that, they just can't put their finger on it, but that person over there seems like they would be great. They, they, can, they can't figure out why. They can't, they cannot, you know, but that person just seems that they would fit. And they're not quite sure about this other person. And so this is where, you know, and so of course, you know, the standard kind of comes in and there's been, there's no change. But this is where I think really leadership has to, you know, has to question when they start seeing patterns. Um, because if, it's, if they don't take that personal interest, I don't think there's going to be change. I give this back. I know. <laughs> Sorry. And thank you for wearing a disruptor shirt. Yeah. Um, management changes, I think, is so powerful. Is, is that when you make the comment uh, tomorrow about how you know leadership comes into play? Is is that when new management comes in? Rebecca's just got you know is now the CEO. That ch change is going to happen, and with change, sometimes you're not the right fit, or if you keep seeing the same thing happening over, maybe it's time for you to move on and not just sit there and try to play the "I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to." So I just want to throw that out there that it, that's a synergy I heard between all of you. So yes, 
Mon, did you have something? I, I mean, I've changed jobs quite a bit, whether it's within the banks or, or outside. I and mean, one of the things that I think is really helpful is you have to get to know your team, and you have to be open, and you have to be a great listener. And if all those things don't happen, when you get around to role clarity and conversations and one-on-ones, it's dysfunction. So it's great to take a step back and ask for that. Like, let's get to know each other. Let's understand what the roles are. Let's understand our strategy and mission. And oh, by the way, how do, how do I play in that? Um, and it gives you a great way to have that open dialogue. Well, do many of you know Susan Stewart of SWBC? Leader, female, she travels to a lot of their branches. And her, she said her job is to figure out what's going on with the employees, not with what's going on with their work. But she finds out what's going on with them personally. How are you doing? How's life? Because she believes that her employees and what's going on in their lives obviously directly impact their work. And also she can be a better, they can have a better culture and she can support her employee base better if she understands how she can help them or what challenges they face. And I thought that was a really great perspective. How much time do we spend in the work day just talking to people we work, work with, excuse me, about stuff that's not work? And I'm not saying we all should just sit and chat, even though that would be lovely, but how often do we take just a moment in a meeting to say, hey, Tamara, how are those twins doing? Do they play soccer? You know, or just something because we're people first. And I, I, I do think that's important for your culture to know that we care about what goes on in your lives, right? You want an employer who cares about what goes on in your lives. Yeah, well, I'm out here delivering champagne because of our shit. Okay, so um, <laughs> for those of you who, and most of us have been in corporate America, we go through a series of trends. And these are productivity trends, right? We wanna make sure we lean in, or you know, think outside the box. Or I worked for a GSE for several years, and the trend then was bring your whole self to work. <laughs> so now, right, bring your whole self. Well, I'm not bringing my whole self, but at any rate. Now we're just, <laughs> we are, uh, but now we're talking about, I mean, Desiree, I'm, I'm wearing my lovely shirt here about Disruptor, and, and Marsha, you're saying, hey, we're going to address workplace disruptors, and my question is, is more about being a disruptor, being a meaningful disruptor, because there's not like there's a disruptor 101 that any of us can take in school. So as leaders, and, as, and, and for those of you all who have um, broken ceilings and you know, done wonderful things, what advice would you give us in, t in terms of how to meaningfully disrupt? What does it mean and what does that look like to you? Wow, that's a great question. And I like the fact you got up and got into it. I like it. So a, a, I have a, a couple of things I would say about that. And I, I've talked to Desiree about this. I think you can be a disruptor and you can do it in a positive way. Because I think when you want to bring up something and if it comes from a place of either anger or annoyance, and this has taken me a long time to get to this space, but just to do it in the most positive way you can, then you're more likely to be heard. You have to be patient because it takes a long time to change behaviors, maybe 21 times, but Tamara knows how often I raise diversity. Gender diversity, people of color, I raise it all the time. And you know what my hope is? that somebody in a meeting goes, wait, you know what? She's gonna come and she's gonna send that neat, nasty email again, and I don't make them nasty, but I get nasty responses. So can we just put some people on here <laughs> so that she will stop coming, either coming down the hall or writing the email? And usually when I respond to the email, I do a reply all. And it just happened this past week, I don't know if you were on it, and 
I got a lot of defensive responses about why there weren't women being nominated for something internally. And I didn't do it negatively. I was very, you know, hey, I think in the future we should broaden the feedback that goes into this list because it would be nice to see, you know. And so I do think you have to come at it and just keep working on it and be positive. And I also will say it's easier now because I'm at a stage in my career where I'm very confident that raising the issue is not gonna hurt my career. I don't think somebody is going to fire me for raising issues inside of MBA. Well, we'll see, I get a new boss. Um, but, so this is on tape, right? I don't think anybody would fire me. Um, but because you're doing, you're trying to do the right thing. You're trying to better the organization. And if you're not, if you don't have a chip on your shoulder and you're not trying to be, you can be a disruptor and not be um, divisive, I guess, is the way I'm saying. Because then you'll be heard. And part of why I gravitate to David is he has these stats and he has these stories and he's working on the culture at Wintrust. And I know some of his employees are here. He's thoughtful about it. And we need leaders, whether they're male or female, to take culture and equality and make it part of how leaders think. And so I just, I, I, I wanna applaud you because you he sought me out, as I said earlier, because he puts his money where his mouth is, right? He said, I wanna get more involved, and here he is, on stage. We might have him on stage again, too. <laughs> so anyway, that's what I just said. This is my opportunity now, and it, this isn't as a result of what you just said. So I have the privilege of working with David. And so one of the things that I will say is taking complete ownership of your outcomes is the most powerful thing that you can do for yourself. And I think when we talk about culture in an organization, it's about making sure that we align with the culture of where we're choosing to work as well. So it's not a matter of just us being chosen by an employer, it's us choosing the employer and making sure that there is a dual responsibility there. So I met with Wintrust nine times before I joined them and I think I was their worst nightmare from an interview perspective because I wanted to make sure the culture aligned. And David met with me and it was the day that he looked at me and said, Trisha, I need two things from you. I said, okay, David, what would that be? He said, first, I need you to make us proud. I said, okay. Second, we are a growth company. And if we are going left and you know we need to go right, I need you standing on the mountaintop, raising your hand, saying, go right, go right, go right. And I make a commitment to you that I will listen. That is why I joined Wintrust. That is why I joined the leader that's on the stage right now. And he upheld those words. It was not just lip service. We were going left. We needed to go right. And I had a conversation with David and he said, when would you be available to talk? And I said, David, I'm leaving tomorrow. I'll be at the airport at 5.30 in the morning. And he said, call me at 5.30 in the morning. Leadership matters. And I think that we also have to own that. We choose to work for the leadership we decide to be in the organization, organization for. And I just think that there's just such a dual responsibility for that. And I just, I thank you for your leadership. I also know that I need someone to challenge me to be the leader that I have yet to become. And we're a growth process and we never stop growing. So just, I wanted to share that. And that was actually before you even spoke. So thank you. Thank you, Tricia. That's humbling to say the least. But um, the topic here today is about creating diversity and inclusion. And, and Marcia and I had a conversation about how or why do certain companies understand the topic and others don't, and how do you change that? And I think the starting point is, is for leaders to ask the question, why do you care? Why, do you, why does it matter to you, not to anybody else, but to you as a leader? And start asking that question. And if the answer comes back to anybody, um, to, to other people, then you'll understand the answer. But if it's all about you, you, you didn't get the joke. You didn't get the note. And so that, to me, is, is the starting point to changing the dialogue, is asking leaders. And you guys be asking your leaders about, is this an important 
topic for your organization, and if so, why? And see what you learn. I'm just gonna make a comment here. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, because this is amazing. You guys are great. But one of the things that I feel is that we do not do, whether women or men, it's just take the opportunity to really present your views, to really be true to yourself. A couple of years ago, probably three years ago, I was approached by the Houston Association of Realtors. I've been with them for eight years. And they asked me, they said, you know, our board of directors would like for you to at least think if you would like to take the leadership for the international board. Well, at the time, the lady that asked me, she's been doing this for 18 years. And when she asked me, I said, I need to think about this. She looked at me kind of like, what do you mean you need to think about it? I said, yeah, no, I take this very seriously. So it took me a couple of weeks. I came back to her and I had a couple of, you know, all of the things that I knew I wanted to accomplish that was true to myself. It was nothing to do with their culture because their culture to me was needing to be improved, not changed, but improved. At the time, the international board was only for residential agents. And it was really, you know, Houston. We are now the third largest city in the nation. And I said to uh, the lady, that the director, I said, look, if you can take this to the CEO and let him know this is what I would like to bring, and if he will at least give me the opportunity to show him how we can do this together, I will consider taking uh, the leadership position. Well, she did. And you know what was funny? She said to me, in 18 years I've been doing this, no one ever have come to us and say, maybe. It's always been, oh, what an honor has been just to even for you to think about me for this position. So my point is, sometimes you have to just be true to yourself and say, yes, I'm here for a purpose, but I also know I can make a difference and I can make changes. And go and present those changes because you never know. I mean, we change to the point that you would never even recognize the board. We even have the city of Houston uh, involved with us. We have MD Anderson. We have so many from many different industries. Nothing to do anymore with just the residential agents, which I'm one of those, but anyways. Just be bold and make the difference. You know what I love about your story? You know your value. And you weren't going to give it away. You didn't want to waste your time. You need it. And so it's a perfect example of knowing if somebody's asking you to do a role like that, really figuring out, is it going to give back to you? Is it going to make you feel like it's your time well spent? And how can you make sure they understand what you expect of them? So I just, I think that's a great story. And congratulations, it sounds like you made really huge progress. Mm -hmm. I think we've run over time, Desiree. We are over time, but does anyone feel like it? No. Um, but thank you for this panel, it's been phenomenal. Um, I wanna thank everyone for coming. And the idea is, is that if you notice who's in the room, we all are from different, parts of the country, we are at different levels, we all do different things. But the idea is, is that we can all take from this panel great conversation back to our industries, our outreach, our impact, and stand up for who we are. But more importantly, leverage and collaborate between our organizations, our self, inner self, our outer self, to make this happen. So thank you again for sharing your stories. I'm so honored that everyone came and we'll continue on with our next uh, event which starts at 5.30 for the mixer that'll be downstairs on the second floor. Um, so come for that and thank you all for being here.